so for how many people is this their first history camp? And thank you all for coming. Uh, pleased to see the, this many people interested in the 17th century. Uh, my name is Dave Weed. Um, I'm one of the three people on the back of the brochure uh, who have been working on this project for the last two years. I will explain very briefly uh, how I got into this and then talk to you about what we have discovered in the Soames Heritage Area, which you can see is not around Boston, <laughs> uh, and not around Plymouth, okay? but this is the area down in what's called Soames, or the southern area. I like to refer to it as the south of New England. Okay? Um, and as you can see from this map, it's about 40 miles from Plymouth, which is where most people in the public think everything happened. But we're working very hard to explain to people that really the untold story is what happened in Psalms, uh, the area essentially between Providence and Bristol, if you've ever been to Rhode Island. How many people have been to Rhode Island? I hope you all Good. I'm, if I were in California, I'd have a different response, right? Um, I live in the town of Warren, and if you go through the little town of Warren, you will find Town Hall there, and if you look up at the frieze above the door, you will see incorporated the town of Warren, and look even closer, it says Soames 1621. Well, you... Ordinarily, you'll think that the town of Warren was started in 1747. But actually, uh, the, the first encounter uh, was between someone who lived here and traveled to Plymouth, uh, who we all know as the Massasoit, because that's a title, and I'm trying to change this. Everybody calls him like that was his first name. It's like president, you know. Well, no, it's President Truman, President Eisenhower, the Massasoit Usamequin. Okay, that was his given name, and the name that he used uh, in the uh, most in his life from uh, 1581 on. Um, but most people encounter him in Plymouth, and they probably assume they haven't done a survey that. He must have grown up and lived nearby, right? Uh, no, <laughs> he lived 40 miles away. He lived in my backyard. <laughs> uh, this is the park behind my house. I don't have a pointer here, I don't think. But if you look up, see that white van shell there? Just to the left of that, if the leaves were off the trees, you'd see my house. This is what's known as Burr's Hill Park. But it was really known in 400 years ago as Burr's Hills because this flat area you see there ha had been taken down when they built a railroad, which is now the bike path that goes right across where that tree line is, and the hills were removed. And in the process, um, Charles Carr, 1913, removed the contents of 42 gravesites in Burr's Hill um, because people, including people building the railroad in 16, 1841, were removing skeletons, but also burial items like ceramics and pipes and forks and knives and all kinds of things from the gravesites there. And Charles, who was the town librarian and an amateur archaeologist, decided that it was better if he did the rest of the removal and at least could keep those items. Of course, he then gave and sold many of the items to several other museums, um, Heaven Ripper Brown, um, the Hay Museum in New York City, um, and his own little museum that's still there on the second floor of the George Hill Library. <coughs> Well, I retired in 2017. Two months before that happened, members of the Mashpee tribe came, having worked with the town, to get permission 
and dug a hole for a 10 by 10 foot concrete crypt or vault and placed within it over 600 burial items that were taken from that same park uh, a little over 100 years before him. So those items are now back underground under this uh, monument to Osamiquin, uh, placed by, there by the Mashpee tribe. And you can come and visit that monument. Unfortunately, there's no other explanation, and I'm working on a uh, National Park Service uh, style interpretive sign for the park to help people get oriented. Going back to our maps, we run back uh, to the native designations of this territory um, before the uh, English colonists arrived. And we look at the portion of this area that was the Poconocet land. Um, nearly everyone I know knows this area as the Wampanoag, but Wampanoag was the name of the nation of uh, various tribes. I'm glad you agree with me. Uh, not everybody does. Uh, but if you go back to maps prior to 1700, it will say Poconocet. The name Wampanoag didn't appear until after 1700, partly because those people who were self-identified, they didn't call themselves Poconoke like a tribe. They were just the people, okay? But others identified the area as the Poconoke land, and you'll see that on many maps. But after the King Philip War, 1675-76, if you said you were Poconoke, or you spoke the language, the English had permission to shoot you on sight. So it wasn't a smart idea to identify yourselves as Poconoke. So that name pretty much disappeared from the literature of the time. I'm working now with members of the tribe, um, and they want very much to bring back their original tribal name. Not every one of the native tribes agrees with that, <laughs> okay? And if you know anything about Native American tribes, you know that they're, they're as different from one another as countries are in the world. Okay? Um, so, Psalms was the southern area uh, that essentially was close to the uh, interface between the Massachusetts, the Nipmucks, the Narragansetts, and then Wampanoag or otherwise Poconoke. And this map was a little erroneous because the intersection line should be at Nudaconocet Hill. If you're ever in Providence, it's the western boundary of the city of Providence, and that's where those nations would meet for council. We believe we know the place that they did that. Long before that time, clearly, uh, there were people living in this area for 8, 10, possibly 12,000 years. Uh, there's, if you want to go into the archaeology, uh, there clearly are artifacts and paleo Indian artifacts scattered about in, in various places. But unfortunately, not as much as you might find in other places of the country in the interior simply because most of the settlement during that time was along a coastline that is now well underwater. So uh, if we ever get a reversal of climate change and the uh, glaciers reform and, and then the sea level drops of 10, 12 feet, we might have the opportunity to find those artifacts, but not so much today. Um, it's the most populated area with uh, anywhere from 70,000 to 100,000. Uh, they didn't do a census then, so it's just guesses at this point. Uh, but we do know that they lived quite successfully in that uh, the populations had grown over a period of time pretty much to match the food supply. Um, and from all accounts, uh, uh, the life of people who were native to that area uh, was abundant and successful. And I just referenced uh, Verrazzano's uh, description 
15.4, when he came into the harbor uh, in Newport, uh, how he described these people as very healthy, tall, robust people who had a pleasant attitude, as contrasted with the people who uh, served on the ship that he came over. <laughs> they, they, they weren't so pleasant. Um, but uh, there was trading, as we know, all along for a hundred years before anybody from England and uh, actually uh, Amsterdam came back. Uh, Leiden came over in 1620. Uh, there were also uh, attempts at uh, um, colonization, at least from an economic point of view, in Virginia. Um, but when the group that came in 1620 arrived uh, to the Native American village of Patuxet, now known as Plymouth, um, they discovered a um, essentially a, the evidence of a holocaust. I, I uh, liken it to, to um, if we had an atomic bomb, a Hiroshima bomb, on the coast of Massachusetts. That's what they found. Uh, though some of the structures, buildings, the, the, the Weetus were still intact, 2,000 people had died there within a three-year period of time. So many so that they, they left the bones to bake in the sun because there was no one left alive to bury the dead. So when Spano came back from England after having grown up there, he discovered everyone he knew was gone. Well, of course, the English in fine style uh, said this is a sign from God. Uh, he has prepared the way. Uh, and uh, though life was certainly difficult, for those folks, particularly during that first winter, they at least really didn't have to pay any attention in large measure to native people because the native people who were surviving were closer to Narragansett Bay, thereby in the Somes area. Uh, they were much less affected than people on the coastline. Uh, but at the same time, they were fearful of going back to the coast for what had happened there, uh, fearing that the same fate might fall, befall them. So um, pilgrims had a chance to, after half of them died, to uh, begin to uh, eke out an existence there on the coast. And until, uh, what, March 21st? Uh, it's just about the anniversary coming up here, uh, when um, the Massasoit, arrives with 60 of his warriors and offers an opportunity to meet and sits down and hammers out the Wampanoag Treaty. Has anybody heard of the Wampanoag Treaty? This is a history camp. You all should have heard of it, but guess what? Nobody tells you anything about it. We hear of, of, uh, certainly about the uh, Mayflower Compact. That gets a lot of press. But the Wampanoag Treaty was a very important treaty uh, that occurred after this meeting, which is always delightfully shown in illustrations. Um, uh, I'm certain it wasn't quite as uh, picturesque as that. Uh, however, this is, the, this is the Wampanoag Treaty. And it basically said, we won't harm you, you won't harm us. If somebody threatens to harm you, we'll help protect you and vice versa. Okay. Not a complicated treaty, but pretty clear in terms of what was going to happen. Why would the Massasoit, who was chief of chiefs over 61 tribes, agree to such a thing? Well, first of all, he had lost a huge portion of his own people. Secondly, the Narragansetts, who were their arch enemies, at least at that time period, <laughs> and who were interested in moving from, if you will, western Rhode Island today into the Soames Heritage Area and all the abundance in terms of food and access to water, etc. <coughs> he feared that they would do that if he didn't ally with the pilgrims because even though they were few in number, they had guns and cannons, okay? And to some degree, this idea that 
they must know something about what killed everybody there. I know nobody knew about germs and things of that sort, but they at least um, had a sense that they had a power that might be helpful against the Narragansetts. So this tree that was hammered out in 1621 is actually signed. They, they met first on March 21st and they came back on April Fool's Day, April 1st, um, and signed that agreement. It took them some time, of course, to pen this agreement, um, but then uh, the Massasoit signed that agreement and this remained in effect for at least 40 years till the Massasoit passed away in their many accounts, 1660, 61, or 62. I'd go 1660. Um, so 40 years of peaceful relations. Unless somebody can correct me, I don't believe anything like that happened anywhere along the East Coast in the 17th century. Certainly not in Virginia. And this was a golden opportunity for the English to not only survive but prosper because they basically had the protection and knowledge base of the native population, which meant that they could um, gain the information they needed to raise their own crops, hunt and fish successfully, and navigate the trails and, and the area throughout the region. This, by the way, is the only evidence that I've seen that the United States government has ever acknowledged uh, the Wampanoag Treaty, so-called, I would call it the Poconoka Treaty, but in any case, um, you all heard of the Sacagawea coin. You turn it over, this is on the other side. Uh, so you probably already have one, and you never looked at it, right? Okay. I understand. So, here's Ed Winslow, um, obviously uh, a, a leader, not the governor uh, in Plymouth, but somebody who really helped speak for and translate to, through translators uh, to the native, to um, Massasoit and his, his people. In 1621, July, after this uh, treaty was signed, he decides, well, I'm going to go pay him a visit. So he and uh, Hampton uh, and uh, uh, Havamonic, uh, the uh, native guide, walked the 40-some miles from Plymouth um, down to what was called Soames, or basically Massasoit's home, if you will. Uh, there are uh, many competing theories as to where that is. If you live in Warren, it was, of course, in Warren. It's on our, our town hall. If, however, you live in Barrington and follow Thomas Bicknell, it must have been in Barrington. And uh, there are wonderful arguments on both sides about where it was. Frankly, it doesn't really matter. Uh, as we know, Native people rarely stayed in one place for long periods of time and would move to their winter camp. And, other places, etc. So it's safe to say that the Massasoit uh, lived in the Bristol, Warren, Barrington area. Okay. Uh, close enough because there's a spring right there uh, on ba the end of Baker Street in Warren that says the Massasoit Spring. So that must be where he lived, right? <laughs> and if you're a Virginia Baker and hear it, that's what you'll say. Of course, you can go across the river and look at the Massasoit Spring in Barrington as well. <laughs> the truth of the matter is there are probably 30 springs in the area. Okay, so it, you know, it doesn't kneel up there. So not only did uh, um, our good friend uh, Ed Winslow come down in 21, two years later at least, we don't know if he made up any other visits, but he, in Ward's relation, just makes this wonderful multi-page description of his visit, his travels there, and what happened. It's absolutely worth a read if you haven't had a chance to do that. Uh, but he hears that the Massasoit is deathly ill, and he wants to go down there and see him before he passes. So they take the two-day journey down there. By the way, it was a two-day journey if you were an English colonist, even with a guide, but if you were a native warrior, you could make that trip and back in one day. Okay? They were that good in terms of their running abilities. 
Uh, so in 23, he comes down, um, and he also has heard that there's a Dutch trading ship there, another reason to show up. Unfortunately, he doesn't make it in time. The Dutch trading ship leaves. He was also informed that the Massasoit had died, only to learn a few hours later that he was still alive. He visits him in his weekend there, uh, finds him on his deathbed, surrounded by his uh, family and supporters and tribe members, and does the one thing that any good English leader did at the time, you treat the person for their illness. They had no doctors. If you were an English leader, you were the doctor. And he administered uh, the, the best medicine he knew how. Uh, he even had uh, ordered chicken soup at one point. But, uh, <laughs> but miraculously, the Massasoit recovers. He recovers his eyesight. He, I won't go into all the details about his bowels, but uh, everything gets better, let's put it that way. And they cemented their friendship for the rest of their lives. Okay? So if the treaty weren't enough, now the Massasoit is indebted for life uh, to Ed Winslow. And that relationship really became the basis of the peaceful uh, relationships from then on. So if you're ever down in Warren, uh, in Barrington, this is, uh, you know, Tyler Point in Barrington. That's the uh, Warren River on the right and the Barrington River on the left. Um, doesn't look like that today, does it? <laughs> this is a Google map where I just erased the town <laughs> and put in. <laughs> but you will, well, how else are you going to recreate the 17th century? I'd love to have had a drone shot from then. <laughs> but the bottom line is, you see some tree areas, but here's Warren, which was called Brooks Pasture. This was wide open land. This was land that the English were just enthralled with. Miles Standish came down and called it the uh, flower, uh, the, the garden of the patent, and the flower, though we spelled it F O U R, of the garden. Okay, so this garden was so described because of this open, cleared land. And you might think, well, how did, they didn't have steel axes, how did they clear this? Well, for centuries, they had been burning off the undergrowth <coughs> and the trees, etc. And by the time the pilgrims arrived there, that's what they saw in this Psalms or southern area. It was wide swaths of open land, perfect for what? Yeah, for grazing. Right? So they could bring their animals in, for planting, okay? Looked just like England, okay? <laughs> Which had been denuded of trees by that time. So they set up a, a trading post. This is the Hoxie trading post on the Cape. But uh, uh, there is one very brief description of a trading post, probably at Tyler Point, uh, down there at the point of the peninsula. And native people living in various clusters around the area. Here's Miles and his reference to the, the uh, flower of the garden. Um, wasn't long, another uh, 14 years, before our friend um, Roger Williams uh, began his trek. You know, he started uh, uh, his ministry when he came over from England in Plymouth, then went up to Salem, and then you're probably roughly familiar with the fact that he didn't get along real well up there, um, and he was uh, banished, uh, um, notified that he had, they were going to take him back to England. But three days earlier, he escapes from his house and walks uh, the 60 miles from Salem down to Psalms because he knew the Massasoit from his time in Plymouth. And he asked the Massasoit, where can I go? Where can I establish the town that I want to, uh, the settlement that I want to do? And the Massasoit um, suggests that he uh, head up to um, what's now East Providence. But um, he was not feeling well. 
having traveled those 60 miles and one of the worst winters uh, recorded at that time. So he stops at a place called Margaret's Cave. Not really a cave, it's, it's uh, more like a, well it's at the end of a large rock outcrop. <coughs> And, but you could lean some logs up against it and make a crude shelter there. Margaret, we believe, was a native woman uh, uh, who met, met the masters who to assign the task of nurturing Williams, uh, who was a great friend of native people. I mean, you know, there was a lot of love between them. Uh, so he stayed there for 14 weeks, approximately, as his own description goes. and. Um, the Massasoit suggests he go up along the Seekonk River, just across the river from Providence today, and uh, uh, sets up a small settlement on a mega pond, plants his crops, only to find out that the governor in Plymouth says, nope, you gotta leave, uh, you're on our territory. So he removed uh, from that area, and the, if you're from Providence, everybody knows the story, you know, he and his followers go across the river and are greeted by the Narragansett chief uh, uh, and Canonicus and uh, uh, with what to meet, uh, uh, what cheer meet up, <laughs> um, which is kind of a combination of English and uh, uh, the Algonquin language. Uh, so uh, he arrives over here at a mega pond, which you can see today, and there is a marker, though it's practically invisible from the street, and it talks about uh, the spring that he established there. You can still see a couple of 17th century houses nearby in East Providence, which, if you're familiar with how things changed there, this, this place was in two towns and three, uh, two states within 100 years. Uh, uh, this was Rehoboth, uh, the Rehoboth territory, but at the time it was not, uh, when Williams landed there in 1636. Um, the best place to learn about Roger is down at the National uh, William, Roger Williams um, Memorial on North Main Street in Providence. Uh, it's worth a visit. It's not a big place there, but they have a good display. And if you've got a chance to talk to the park ranger, John McNiff, he is Mr. Roger Williams. He probably knows more than anybody about him and his life, and he'd be happy to talk with you. I do, by the way, a 17th century Rhode Island meetup group, and I've got John scheduled for uh, June 20th. So you get on the 17th century meetup, and you'll find that program, and you can sign up. Uh, this is what Providence looked like about 1650, and since you're probably not all that familiar with Providence, I won't point out all the details of where the state house is and where they do water fire now. But up in the top there is New Connecticut Hill. Remember, I told you. That's where the four tribes met. So that's just on, out, on the outskirts of, of Providence. There's also a bridge there. Um, doesn't look like it's from 1680, but that was where the first bridge that formed Providence was built. Uh, and guess who the toll taker was? Roger Williams. <laughs> you got to make a living somehow. Uh, so that's the eighth bridge that was there. And I lead tours down there. It's a lot of fun. If you also follow the, the whole evolution here of land transfers, of state lines, it's a mess. <laughs> okay. uh, basically, these were various purchases, okay, and overlapping jurisdictions, if you will, which finally resulted in this very strange line here from 1747, which is why Warren is always uh, shown as 1747, but it actually had become a town uh, even before that uh, as part of Swansea. Uh, the one town that didn't ever change was Bristol, which is that lower peninsula, because that was native land until after the King Philip War. Uh, but if you want to want to get into all this, it's, it's quite a fascinating history. And, I have a hard time keeping up with all of it. Um, there in East Providence, uh, which was Rehoboth to start, uh, a tract of either 8 by 8 or 10 by 10 miles, depending on who you read, um, the Newman Church was established in 1643 um, by, of course, uh, uh, Newman, who had come over from England 
uh, and was part of the separatist movement, if you will, out of Weymouth and brought uh, believers with him. Uh, you can still see some of those uh, grave sites right across from the church. Um, not far from there is Hunts Mills uh, on the Ten Mile River. Um, if you know anything about the establishment of Rumford and that part of East Providence, you'll recognize the Ten Mile River, which kind of draws a big circle around a good portion of what was known as the Ring of the Green. So everybody had a front door, if you will, to their property on the green, which was quite large, and then their back door was on uh, one of the rivers there, including the Seekonk River. So not bad for a uh, first property. Of course, every one of those houses would burn in the King Philip War, so you really can't find any existing houses. But the mills uh, along the Ten Mile River are still celebrated at, at Hunts Mills, which is the East Providence Historical Society land, and is an opportunity to understand the growth of uh, those uh, that early uh, industrial period uh, that started in mid uh, 17th century. Uh, a few miles from there, up in what is still Rehoboth, that other part, Rehoboth gets divided in first into Seekonk and then again into East Providence, Seekonk, and Rehoboth. Uh, but in Rehoboth, if you wander through those narrow roads through the woods, you will come across uh, a little settlement that also had a mill there. There's a couple of markers, including one for uh, these blockhouses that were set up as garrisons uh, during uh, attacks during the King Philip War. There are none in existence, but the town is doing what they can to at least mark those areas. Uh, King Philip War, I could be here for the, the rest of the day talking about the King Philip War. Relax, I'm not going to. Uh, this was essentially a product of colonial settlement all around uh, the Bristol Peninsula, Consumpet Neck, and Mount Hope, which you may have heard of, was the home of King Philip. That's still there and still not uh, uh, developed. So uh, you can go to the seat there, you go to Mount Hope Farm and ask for permission. But you can at least begin to see all those little yellow areas there were surrounding the native settlements that remain down here um, in what is today Bristol. Um, the population, we believe, from the early 1700s of the uh, native people living there was about 7,000. By the time of the King Philip War, it was about 700. Uh, that had to do with everything from more disease outbreaks. Uh, there was one in 1633 and another one after that. Uh, but I attribute it more to simply the stress of colonization. These are people who had lived their own way for 10,000 years, and now the English were imposing their way on them. Uh, though there was cooperation, and there are various points of view in terms of um, you know, whether this was mutual or not, but uh, it, was, it became clearer and clearer after the Massasoit's death in 1661 uh, that the relationship that had been established for those first 40 years was beginning to go south. And you can read uh, the story of John Sassamon and his death and the trial, etc., etc. All kinds of reasons why that war happened. But it happened at a point when the native population was basically saying, um, if we don't do this, we don't have this war, and essentially drive the English back to where they came from, we will be gone. It won't be long. So the war breaks out. Um, again, I won't go into the details of that. Most of you probably know a good deal about it. And it swept west, and then we believe the attempt was going to be to move east because their allies were in the west. And they could very well. There was a point in the early 76 when it didn't look very good for the colonists. And some of them were already going back to England at that point. Um, but the English began under church uh, to um, 
start uh, using the same tactics that uh, King Philip had used, more guerrilla style fighting, got the upper hand. Uh, uh, John Alderman, uh, who was a Native American himself, ends up because uh, Church's gun misfired, uh, shoots uh, King Philip uh, and in the Myra Swamp in Bristol, and there's a marker for that. And again, the long history of uh, those who weren't killed were enslaved or m moved out of the area. And the so-called disappearance of Native people, not true, but that's what everybody thought or wanted. So let me just finish here with some of the places that you can go and visit. Uh, this is the garrison, the marker for the garrison house, very close to where the war broke out. It's still there, and you can find it by going to the SoamsHeritageArea.org website. All of this is described there, lots of pictures, Google Maps to get you there, etc. Um, Anawan Rock, where the final battle, if you will, of, of, of the church uh, uh, already having killed uh, uh, King Philip, uh, confronts Anawan, his uh, lieutenant, and uh, captures him, doesn't kill him, but he's sent to Plymouth, and uh, his head's cut off there. So. Um, various places, uh, I love ancient Little Rock Cemetery, Little Neck, sorry, Little Neck Cemetery in uh, uh, East Providence. Uh, it's the uh, location where uh, 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 Elizabeth Tilly is buried, and it's a wonderful story, because she came over from England as a little girl, lost her parents, etc., etc., and marries, um, and ends up of going through the King Philip War and dies after that. And I we think she's the only person who has that trajectory, having come from England, going through the war, and surviving, and uh, dies there. Um, John Miles is uh, buried there, as are a number of people in different cemeteries around there. Again, it's all detailed on the website. I've looked at all the, the evidence of the 17th century in this area. I find lots of natural areas, some of the farms that haven't changed in that in that 400 years. Uh, this one in Warren was uh, a King's Grant farm, it's still in operation, and we're working with the owner there on this. Uh, I work with the land conservation folks and uh, um, to reveal places that you can go and find what it might have been like at the time. Now I'll get to some questions in just a minute. Um, Wonderful places like King's Rock that no one had discovered, that we found that thousands of people drive by every day and know nothing about, and a, what I believe to be a perched or balanced rock right across the street from that, a Native American site. Again, no documentation. This is my conjecture. And Abrams Rock, and here's King Philip's seat that you could still go to, and here's the meeting place of Nudicomicate Hill. Uh, Bristol, after the war was laid out, and it's a wonderful town, but not much left of the 17th century, other than a few houses. First house ever built in Bristol, up there on the upper right, it's right on the main street on the way into town. Uh, it's apartment houses now, unfortunately, not restored, but that uh, house was, the wood was brought over from England to build that. Uh, and then the first church that was built there, and this is what that place looked like in uh, about 1906. It was called Silver Spring and artifacts in the church that were brought uh, over from England again, and the burial site. You can see all that when you get on the website and go visit. Here are the, the uh, other two 17th century houses in Bristol. That's it, there are just three houses left from the 17th century there. And then the other 17th century houses are all detailed on the website. Uh, you can drive by them. The only one that's open is the Martin House in Swansea, and they do tours on, on July and August on Sunday afternoons. Um, back to where we started. Uh, this is the Osamequin uh, Memorial that's in Burr's Hill, and you can, that's the vault that they buried, and they have a celebration there. And I, I work with the Poconoka tribe primarily because they are the people who were there. The, um, I don't know if anybody here is Mashpee, but they didn't start until 1833, and they were not in the war. And uh, you know, there's some contention among tribes as who's really you know uh, descended from that society. But this guy right here is uh, our uh, Sagamore. Um, 
Bill Guy lives in Barrington, and uh, we're doing a presentation the next Thursday night, and I'll be with him up at uh, the uh, rededication of the uh, King Philip seat. And we're just about out of time, so if you want to find out more, go to Sums Heritage Area. You can go on your phone, you can find a map, click on any of those locations, it'll take you directly to those pages. So, I think I'm done. All right. Thank you very much. And if we got, uh, do we have a couple minutes? Yeah. No? A couple minutes for questions. Back there. I grew up in Sudbury, Mass, where I lived on Coconut Road and Massasoit oh. Road, was down yes. the street in Phillips Avenue. And I used to play in an area where there was supposedly an Indian, uh, uh, you know, ground form stone that was used. Oh, for granted. So they weren't, they, the King Philip War was not up there at all? It was. Oh, it was yes. all over the place. Oh, Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I'm glad you pointed that out about those street names because that, that's the one legacy we have from that period of time. Oh, yeah. Indian Hill, I looked at what was called Indian Hill early on, then it was built over. Yeah, there's you will find street. all over New England the references to that. Yeah, yeah, there was another question down yeah. here. Good. But what about the statue of Massasoit? What's the story there? Well, uh, all I, I can't remember is an Italian sculptor from the 30s who put that together. and. Uh, no one knows what he looked like. He was just simply described as tall and lusty. <laughs> lusty meaning muscular. Where is it? Pardon? Where is it? In Plymouth. It overlooks the, the, the thing. It just if you're if you're at the rock, go up the hill. It's right up there. You can see it. The overlooks the whole thing. Yep. Mary Rollins. Yep. Yep. She could be. I'm not that familiar with those parts of Massachusetts. But does anybody know where Mary Rollins is buried? Keep asking. Google it. You'll find it in church. <laughs> Other questions? Yep. Yeah. Was, was there a form of written communication that the neighbors, uh, Native Americans had with each other? With each other. Why do you need writing? <coughs> you have fire and smoke signals. No, they could get a message from well, Bristol up to up to Mount Wachusett in 15 there's minutes. There's some. There's some evidence uh, with other. Other native tribes on bark and things of that sort, there is some, but no evidence that I'm aware of of, of the folks in this part of the. Um, they had the English transcriptions of the language. We had we have transcriptions of of the language because Elliot's Bible. Yes, because of Elliot's Bible. I was just in Natick last night. I looked at a copy of Elliot's Bible last night, um, but that was. That was written under uh, Eliot's uh, leadership by Native Americans, who then wrote down the best phonetic translation of their language. They had no written language at that time. Right. He did. He did. He did. America. It was wonderful and nice read. Uh, if you want to get a flavor of what that was like, so the problem is until. Um, the recovery in on the Cape of um, to the Aquina and uh, of their language, nobody really knows what it sounded like. You know, it's the old the last native speaker died. Other questions? Yeah, one more, and then we'll let you go. Could book on this subject, and if not, will you write it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.